Uh, good evening, um, those of you here and those of you online, public, members of the bar, judges, benches, anybody who wants to come, welcome to this Context of Law event, tonight dealing with the question of the adversarial mm -hmm. process, is it fit for purpose? Gosh, <laughs> aren't we lucky? We live in the best parliamentary democracy in the world, which also uses, in large part, the adversarial system, as does the judicial system, which the Lord Chief Justice regularly tells us is the best judicial system in the world. And not only do we know that, but courtesy of parliamentary television, which you can get anywhere around the world, you don't need a license. If you're a family having a family disagreement or a business partnership in Bombay having a problem about whether to buy this company or that, or whether you're simply a person in England deciding whether to send your son to Eton or to the local comprehensive school, you can learn so much from the adversarial system. You tune in at what is 12 o'clock on most Wednesdays. You listen for half an hour to Prime Minister's question time, and you then return to the disagreement which has taken you there. You stand at two swords lengths from one another, hurl personal abuse at one another, state your case without any supporting evidence and assure that this will bring the result. On top of that, if your family has been similarly divided or if your partnership has been similarly divided, they will join you and hate each other. Maybe there are reasons at least to question the adversarial system. And when we come to the criminal side or the criminal trial side of it, who can have any doubts? that in 1950, when Timothy Evans approached, as he did, with the chaplain on his one side, reading from the book, and the noose ahead of him, for a crime he did not commit, no doubt he said, well, at least I've been tried to death by the best legal system in the world. Something that maybe some of the Birmingham bombers also might have said. It is undoubtedly a system that needs consideration. I'm hesitant to tell you this joke that was told to me 50 years ago when I was a junior barrister in Farrah's building by another junior barrister, long, long dead, an Irishman, but with a developed Irish sense of humor who said, the only thing that's better than having a guilty man acquitted is having an innocent one convicted. Now that's a shocking thing, and I'm sure he didn't mean it, but it, it highlights in a horrible graphic way that the adversarial system is not an inquiry into the truth. It is a contest. Its roots are probably in trial by contest, trial by ordeal when the Almighty was working the answer to the problem through whether your hands blistered or not, or whether you drowned or not. It worked its way through the juries, which were originally knowledgeable people, to the juries who were independent people, to the juries who took over the control of the determination of courts from others, to the present day, where the jury is independent, and God bless them for being that, and where the argument is presented on either side, neither side of which need be accurate or truthful. It is worth considering. So before we come to our speakers, it's also worth considering this. Many people in this room, and most of the people occupying the professional chambers in this inn of court, have earned their livings to date and will by being operatives of an accountability process, the adversarial system, which has never been tested on an evidence base for whether it's the right way to do things. And it was interesting that when the Yugoslav Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal uh, in the 1990s and then later the International Criminal Court were established, as far as I can discover, there was no evidence-based analysis of whether that was the right system for these courts. It was a matter, effectively, 
of, of imperialism, cultural imperialism by the English language court systems. My system is best. There is no other explanation for why the system was introduced. And there is certainly no present justification for the proposition that it is definitely the right system to have used. It may be, it may not be, but the adversarial system has, of course, allowed for trials that last 10 years, 10 years, without satisfactory conclusion. For an overall trial process, the Yugoslav Tribunal, that's lasted for 30 years with issues outstanding. And part of that is due to the adversarial system of battle. So before I move on to Lord Bonamy and to David Perry, just this. The adversarial system has, of course, been sensitive to the need to change. And it has changed over time in very significant ways, which have diminished what might be thought the disadvantages of the adversarial system. The sweeping away, as some of us will remember, of technical rules about corroboration, about the evidence of wives and matters of that sort happened, and thus technical arguments within the adversarial system that stopped trials going ahead came to an end. And next, perhaps, and others may have other views, really important development, and I think probably started by a judgment of Baroness Hallett, but I might be wrong, was the developing approach towards vulnerable witnesses. And with that complete change, the establishment of a whole new series of rights, then trials where vulnerable witnesses were involved, involved a totally different approach to questioning them, which was in the English language, may not be translatable elsewhere, was fairer. And then perhaps the greatest single change of all, which has changed the nature of the adversarial British jury trial, was the abolition of the absolute right to silence of an accused person, which means that our system in America is completely divided, correct me if I'm wrong, in America no defendant gives evidence, in England more or less every, every defendant does. So the trials have become much, much more like inquiries into truth, but they still carry with them the single continuing line of belief in the adversarial process, which goes back the best part of a thousand years. So that's what we're going to consider tonight. And it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our two speakers, uh, Lord Bonamy from Scotland. He replaced Judge Richard May, a bencher here, Sir Richard May, when he died in the middle of a case in the Yugoslav Tribunal. We checked him out informally. We asked people from Scotland and he had a reputation for being the fairest of judges who let a defense case be put without any restraint. He operated the adversarial system. In The Hague, he became known very soon as one of the best or the best trial judges. And following the Milosevic case where he was a wing member, he presided over the case of Milutinovic and others, generally regarded as not only the best conducted trial, but actually the most efficient, but within the adversarial system. He's now back there for a short time working on a Rwanda case. He's a security commissioner, and no doubt his ideas have developed, if they have, from being a person who fully supported and operated the system to one who's had so much broad experience, he can inform us all. David Perry, is uh, the dwyan of I don't know how many courts. <clears throat> when I hear about how he's received in courts that have always, in so far as I can remember, treated me with little short of contempt, and how they welcome him, <laughs> how they welcome him and say how, what a real pleasure it is to see him, that reflects a number of things. That he has been in many of the most important cases. He is known not only for his uh, skill within the system, but most particularly for that particular attitude which is essential to any legal system uh, namely he he knows everything that he needs to know and he works extremely hard so he no doubt as one of the many around here who've earned their livings through the adversarial system for a few years uh, will be able to give us all the arguments in favor of retaining it in its present and completely unchanged form the flyer advertised the presence of tracy ailing uh, criminal practitioner of 40 years standing 
and a woman with great powers of foresight, which did not include that her EasyJet flight from France would be cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> and so, much though she would like to be here, she isn't. So we're extremely grateful to Caroline Wilborn for doing what I had asked Tracy Ayling to do. Caroline Wilborn, a practitioner of 50 years standing, criminal jury cases, but also a lot of family cases. And I've asked her to ask perhaps a couple of questions of each of our speakers when they finished. And they'll have 10 minutes, 10 minutes, maybe a short exchange. And to ask them in the way that we have questions asked in this series of lectures, that is question only, sharp, no thanks, no identification of anything, straight in. That's what the advocate does, and that's what Caroline, I hope, will be doing. Regardless of whether she agrees with them or not, she will put a client's case, but it may not be theirs, and it may not be hers. After that, questions and answers for you, but on the same basis as to how the questions <coughs> should be asked. So, with that, by way of introduction, and not in any way expressing my own opinion, <laughs> Lord Bonnery. Thank you, Geoffrey, for setting the battle line so clearly. Um, I was a little taken aback when I learned that my opponent was to be the renowned David Perry. I say renowned because I learned of him a considerable number of years ago when reports of his exploits here were relayed back to Scottish judges by Alan Roger, a, a friend and colleague, the late Rod, Lord Roger of Errolsferry, who uh, can be seen even in the law reports as expressing his relief when he saw that appearing for the Crown was Mr. David Perry. Um, he was quite a fan of David Perry. In fact, I would have described him, I think, as a groupie in, <laughs> in, in modern life. Oh, and I'm certain he'll have many of them. I suppose if he had been dropped into this era rather than arriving here by a route taking 60 or so years, he'd probably be described as an influencer with many thousands of Twitter followers. So it's a privilege to share the platform tonight with him. Um, initially, I was also thrown by the reference to our adversarial system in the question. I'm not sure that all are the same. However, there's no point in debating that tonight, so I decided not to dwell on it and instead concentrate on the systems with which I am familiar. That's in Scotland and also in the international criminal justice system. Our law reports in Scotland are littered with judicial expressions of frustration at the lack of control judges have over proceedings and the absence of a dedicated aim to ascertain the truth that are core weaknesses of the system. We know that the absence of judicial control is recognized as a core weakness because of all the efforts over the years that have been made to introduce judicial case <laughs> management and then to develop it. Probably the best example I can give of the expression of that frustration was the opinion of the Lord Justice Clark Thompson in a case in 1961, Thompson against Glasgow Corporation, when he said, judges sometimes flatter themselves by thinking that their function is the ascertainment of truth. This is only in a very limited sense. Our system of administering justice and civil affairs proceeds on the footing that each side working at arm's length selects its own evidence. It's on the basis of two carefully selected versions that the judge is finally called upon to adjudicate. He cannot make investigations on his own behalf. It might be different if he was Judge John Deed, I suppose. And he, and he cannot call witnesses. His undoubted right to question <coughs> witnesses who are put into the witness box has to be exercised with caution. A litigation is, in essence, a trial of skill between opposing parties conducted under recognized rules, and the prize is the judge's decision. We've rejected inquisitorial methods and prefer to regard our judges as entirely independent. Like referees at boxing contests, they see that the rules are kept and count the points. 
And we know, we know, we know also that the very fact that control of the proceedings lies in the hands of the parties, up to 50% or so of whom have reason to conceal the truth, means that elements in the system may be used, indeed are used, to frustrate the quest for the truth. One of the prime tools deployed for that purpose is, of course, cross-examination, with its ever-attended risk that attention, particularly that of a jury, will be focused on the performance of the cross-examining counsel and on his leading questions, both frequently distractions from the only real meaningful subject matter of the case, that's the evidence. Law courts have over many years doubled as performance spaces for many who would find themselves very much at home on the stage. The content, delivery, and timing of a leading question on an important issue in the case can often have an impact on the result way beyond the significance of the answer. So it is my first submission, Mr. Moderator, that that, that point alone is sufficient to demand a negative answer to the question posed tonight. And just as you are blessed in the English and the courts of England and Wales with many very talented advocates, skilled in the art of stretching the rules to their advantage, the same is the case in Scotland. And the challenge for the court is to anticipate when the rules are being stretched to breaking point. Let me give you an example from 2014, a case involving 17 charges, historic charges of sexual abuse in the early 90s and rape. The two-day cross-examination of the complainer by senior counsel opened with this exchange. You are a wicked, deceitful, malicious, vindictive liar. No, I'm not. And you've been so for the last 20 years. No, I have not, because you've been trying to get the accused into trouble for the last 20 years. No, I have not. And this is your last hurrah. No, I have not. Now, each of these uh, statements in the law reports end with a question mark. The substantive element of the cross-examination continued in similar fashion. It, it generally pursued perceived inconsistencies or contradictions with a written statement of some 40 pages taken by the police in 2012, thus itself many years removed from the alleged offenses. The complainer, that's the the name we give to uh, the, uh, vic the alleged victim, expressed her, her shame about everything. Um, at a relatively early point in cross-examination, when the witness's testimony was being tested in relation to what had happened in 1990, she responded to counsel, you weren't there. You never got it done to you. You never knew exactly how many times and what all happened. And then, as the judge tried to calm the complainer down in the face of her protest, she said, I'm not taking this, I'm not taking that crap. At a later, a later stage, having been questioned by the judge about the appellant putting a child's arm under a grill, the cross continued. You see, all the histrionics are to make up for the fact that you're getting caught out time and time again. Why? No, it's not. And it's going to happen for the rest of the day. Now, that was indeed an ominous reference, presumably intended to give notice of the potential length of the complainer's presence in the witness box, which turned out to be true. In the end of the day, the appeal was dismissed. Um, and after refusing the appeal, the court said the following, due regard must be had to the right or privilege under domestic law to test the witness's evidence by properly directed and focused cross-examination. 
That right, however, does not extend to insulting or intimidating a witness. It also requires to be balanced against the right of a witness to be afforded some respect for her dignity and privacy. The court must be prepared where appropriate to interfere when cross-examination strays beyond proper bounds, both in terms of the nature of the questioning and the length of time for which a complainer can be expected to withstand sustained attack. In this case, it's doubtful whether the ubiquitous informed bystander would have regarded the conduct of this trial as affording that respect for this complainer's rights. You might think a rather meek response to the events that had just preceded uh, or had just been the subject of their consideration. Um, they seem fairly restrained in the face of woman's reaction is plainly not the result of realizing she has been caught out by genuine questions, but of feeling insulted and abused in the court. Her apparently petulant outbursts are a clear statement that she herself was being abused rather than questioned. And she knows how the system works. She was familiar with the system. She knows it's contentious and adversarial, but that was her reaction. So my second submission is that the actual damage done and the potential for damage to be done to witnesses in the course of cross-examination also demands a negative answer to the question. Transport that style of cross-examination to the International Criminal Court set up and try to imagine the state of confusion and shame engendered in the minds of Albanian women, victims of sexual assault and rape in the course of the conflict by Serbian soldiers. For reasons related to social mores, many delayed reporting these attacks for fear of being ostracized by family and friends. Counsel and accused who often conduct conducted their own defenses nevertheless repeatedly accused them simply of lying or giving evidence that was completely unbelievable, to take one particular example, without establishing any basis for the accusation. And in fairness to the judges, it's a difficult situation to handle when you can't actually anticipate exactly what the question coming will contain and move on further to calling an Albanian farmer, a peasant farmer, a liar. That was instantly perceived as a personal insult of the gravest kind. The initial reaction of the witness was confusion. Then when told that the accused was simply putting his case in, the way, in, in this way as an assertion, because that was part of the, the system, there followed a tirade of uh, offensive abuse of counsel. The first time I ever spoke on the subject of proceedings in these courts, uh, I described uh, the situation I'm outlining here as carrying the conflict into the courtroom and described it as post, I po the, described the courtroom as a post-conflict battlefield. Witnesses were even seen to collapse. The female witnesses accused in the way that they were uh, on two occasions I uh, was present and simply collapsed in the witness box. So that's my third point, Mr. Moderator. It's unfair to a witness who is genuinely unfamiliar with the system and again demands a negative answer. And my fourth and final point is that um, the fact that we, with the aim of protecting vulnerable witnesses, have been modifying our ordinary adversarial rules specifically for sexual offense and rape trials since the 1970s, and now in the 2020s are contemplating more radical changes than ever before, proves not only that the system is not fit for purpose, <coughs> excuse me, but also that it is beyond repair. 
I note that the Law Commission of England and Wales is hard at work here and that in Scotland, a pilot study of judge-only courts to be followed by a civil service evaluation of the results is proposed. Every association in Scotland representing solicitors throughout the country has vowed to boycott the pilot. That's not surprising uh, in, in the, uh, well, because it followed on a statement by the Justice Secretary that uh, he would consider any radical reforms to trial procedures if they improved conviction rates for sex crime. So for these reasons, Mr. Moderator, I beg to move the question be answered in the negative. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and, um, and thank you for the, for the warm words of introduction. I will be contending that the Anglo-American adversarial trial is among the chief glories of the common law system. It has stood the test of time. It has the common law's genius for evolution and adaptation, and it is the system for which we would all contend if we, behind a veil of ignorance we were asked to design a system in which we ourselves might stand accused of crime. The motion raises two issues. First, what is the adversarial system? And second, what is its purpose? The defining feature of the English adversarial system is that it involves trials conducted by skillful professionals on both sides of the case. We can thank the adversarial system for the fact that this jurisdiction and other common law jurisdictions in which the adversarial trials take place has such brilliant lawyers who are themselves responsible for bringing about legal change. Nowhere else in Europe or anywhere in the world will you find such skillful, practical professionals on both sides of the case. In the European systems, by contrast, evidence is gathered by judges, and this is what you have to think about, or judge-like investigators, public officers, who are charged with the duty to investigate, and the facts and the criminal investigation becomes the judicial function. And I'll be illustrating why this is the very reason we moved away from that sort of system to the adversarial system, because our experience was that judges bullied defendants into pleading guilty or they didn't give them a trial. So these are the values that we might be sacrificing if you um, change. In the European trial, the presiding judge examines the witnesses, the lawyers for the prosecution and the defense play subordinate roles, mostly recommending lines of inquiry, sometimes supplementing the court's questioning of witnesses. So that's the, that's the difference. That's the adversarial system, and that's the other, uh, the, the continental system. As for the second issue, the purpose of adjudication in the adversarial system. Now, everyone thinks it's easy. Of course, the purpose is to do justice. And what does justice mean in every case? It means the guilty are convicted and the innocent go free. But those aren't the only values that we recognize in our system. There are normative aspects to a criminal trial. The adversarial trial is not simply about the prevention of crime. The conviction of the guilty and the acquittal of the innocent should also take place in a fair and open manner which commands public confidence and where the parties participate on equal terms. And this is the adversarial system. 
I'm just going to give a, a little historical thumbnail sketch of how we came to have an adversarial system because it's actually rather modern and it does shed a light on why we have it and why we cherish it. The adversarial system took shape relatively late in English legal history. Until the late 1600s, so you're talking about the time of Charles II, uh, James II, up until that time, trials were largely do-it-yourself affairs. They were lawyer-free. And defending yourself in a trial was uh, an activity which was really speaking, there was no uh, uh, right to silence, the main purpose of the trial, this contest of amateurs, was to give the accused an opportunity to speak in person. And there was no room for defence counsel. The defendant was expected to clear himself. So that was the system. The judge would do like the presiding judge in Europe. The judge would take control of the proceedings. It all sounds absolutely fine until you get to the Monmouth Rebellion and you have Judge Jeffreys. And Judge Jeffreys goes to the West Country and has batches of verdicts. About 600 people are convicted in less than a week. Uh, the average time of the trials is usually about eight minutes. And the trials, those trials had followed the Popish plot, the Rye House plot, and various other cases in which aristocratic defendants, the nobility, had been charged with treason. So what did Parliament do? It knew that the, the inquisitorial system, the European system, wasn't working. It didn't work. You needed to have protection against judges. So they passed the Treason Trial Act, 1696, an act which Sir James Fitzjames Stephen uh, called the most unprincipled piece of class legislation ever enacted by the English Parliament. And the reason why it was so unprincipled and class-based is it only applied to treason. And who was being charged with treason but the nobility? So for the first time, the nobility were allowed to have defence counsel and defence advocates. But of course, democratisation says they've got a very good thing going for them. We want it. So although the Treason Trials Act was um, uh, uh, allowed legal representation for those charged with treasonable intrigues, defence counsel began to appear in ordinary cases over the course of the 1700s. And would you believe it, until 1836, you were prohibited from having defence counsel. It was only in 1836 that Parliament, after a parliamentary, after the, the, Victoria, uh, uh, the, the um, Georgian law commissioners um, suggested reform in, that was enacted in 1836. them until that time they there'd never been a right to it and in fact until 1730 you had no right to an indictment that wasn't in Latin but anyway the progressive rationalization of the law has continued to this day but the structure of the trial has remained remarkably resilient and I'm going to suggest that the reason why the structure of the trial has remained remarkably resilient is that as the law commissioners who supported the 1836 legislation suggested, the adversarial system ensures a thorough investigation of the facts, it is fair and ensures that verdicts command public support. And I'm going to give various reasons just very shortly as to what we have to thank the adversarial system for. First, we have to thank the adversarial system for a law of evidence that ensures that decision-making is rational and structured. That is what the law of evidence, you may criticize it, but that is what the law of evidence 
is designed to achieve, structured, rational decision-making, what Jeremy Bentham would say uh, to ensure rectitude of decision-making. Second, it's thanks to the adversarial system that we have a right to silence. Remember the altercation trial, the unstructured case, the do-it-yourself affair, where defendants were told you have to put forward your defense, you have to tell us now what it is. It was the lawyers who said, no, that's not fair. Third, it's thanks to the adversarial system of trial, we have the confessions rule that excludes suspect or pretrial confessions from consideration by uh, a court. Unlike in uh, Europe, where torture was uh, countenanced, the common law set its face against torture, and the confession rule was developed by lawyers protecting um, the citizen from state. Fourth, it's thanks to the adversarial system of trial, we do not allow cases to be, side, to be decided by overbearing, bullying judges whose sympathies lie with the state. And you will say, well, we don't have that sort of judge anymore, but I regret to say that they still exist, and there are some, and if that's the price we have to pay for the adversarial system to make sure we have fair verdicts, then it's the price I suggest we have to pay. Fifth, it's thanks to the adversarial system of trial that we have a beyond reasonable doubt standard of proof. It was developed in the common law system. And above all, the adversarial system has played a role in the creation of a specialized legal profession with practical forensic skills. Anyone who practices in Strasbourg or Luxembourg will know from the judges in those courts that they always look forward to being addressed by English advocates rather than advocates from the continental uh, jurisdictions. And the simple reason for that is that the English advocates have honed their skills to put forward their cases in the most structured and compelling way that they can. And this is another value that you would lose if you change the adversarial system. The adversarial system has reinforced the independence of the judiciary because it is lawyers who are blamed for the problems in the law, not the judges. That is why judges are always asked to come to the rescue, to chair public inquiries. It's why verdicts are accepted by the public because they're not mouthed by judges or, or uh, the result of judicial bias. And the, 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 the system has certainly not outlived its purpose. It permits rigorous testing of testimony through cross-examination, the best mechanism yet devised for exposing mistaken or malevolent evidence. And if there are criticisms about uh, the way that cross-examination is conducted, the fault lies with judicial management of the trial and control. The adversarial system fosters a sense of equality between the state and the citizen, as it did originally in the later Stuart times between the crown and the subject. There is no imbalance in our system between the prosecution and the defense, and the judge is the neutral umpire. And uh, it enhances the public right of access to justice by conducting the trial as a single not a process of interrogatories and investigation completed by judicial fee. And I've already mentioned the contribution that the common law has made uh, to the development of the law. The, the, the system remains vigorous. It is fit for purpose. The old pre-trial procedures, which led to uh, miscarriages of justice, such as those Geoffrey mentioned, which had a strong prosecutorial bias, the use of local justice of the peace, the English local civic activist whose job it was to help build the prosecution case has been replaced by a professional police service and independent prosecuting authority. And through the ubiqu ubiquitous technique the common law has of adaptation, um, case
all litigation is an inquiry into contested truth, which in the absence of advocates would suffer from imperfect understanding. We need a strong legal profession and we need an adversarial system. And I would uh, suggest that the adversarial, the answer to the motion is the adversarial system is fit for purpose and it has been fit for purpose since it was introduced as a counterweight to Stuart tyranny. Mm. I'd like to ask Lord Bonamy and David Perry, the, give them the opportunity to ask each other perhaps a couple of questions before Caroline Wilborn <clears throat> helps us and then we move over to you. But I, I hope I can at least start the questioning in this way between the two speakers by picking up on David Perry's first point, Lord Bonamy. In the circumstances that you found yourself charged with something, I don't know what, something improper in relation to a motorhome, say, um, <laughs> of, of which you were entirely innocent, is the adversarial system the one that you would prefer rather than any other? You have not, I'm going to answer this as a, from a personal perspective, and it's an answer I've always had. If I'm ever charged with anything serious, I want the person who finds me guilty to give me a good reason for that decision. And that doesn't happen in the adversarial system. Is there anything else you'd like to challenge of what David Perry has recently told us? And then David can have a similar opportunity with you. The, the only historical uh, issue uh, that I, I wondered about uh, for me was that, and, and it may be that England and Scotland were different, but up until roughly the end of the 19th century, the, an accused person in Scotland couldn't give evidence. Now, was that not the same in, 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 in England? And if it was, it, then does it not undermine at least part of what you're saying about the opportunity to present your defence? <clears throat> Well, the, 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 that, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. The, the, it's absolutely right that until 1898, an accused person was not entitled to give evidence in their own defence on oath. On oath is the important thing. And that remained the case even in the certain states of the United States, such as Georgia, for example. Georgia was the last of the United States to abolish the testimonial impediment faced by a defendant, and they had that rule until 1962. What the common law did, part of its genius, was to say, you can't perjure yourself by giving evidence on oath, but you can make a statement from the dock. That's why you used to have all these statements <clears throat> from the dock years ago. And the distinction was, it was the old common law rule, it applied in civil cases as well, that the parties couldn't give evidence on oath because it was feared that if they lied, they would damn their soul. And therefore, rather than risk damnation, you took away the um, temptation. Now, um, what, um, what, what happened was, um, E even in the time of Judge Jeffreys, you couldn't give evidence on oath. You were just bullied into saying, well, what do you say about this? What do you say? What's your answer to what the, what, what the prosecution are saying? And all these rules uh, about the rules of evidence were, were devised, not only uh, as a protection against judges, but also uh, to ensure that there was um, proper public confidence. And on the reasons point, just very briefly, sorry, I don't want to take up too much time, but on the reasons point, um, we do know why um, people are convicted. Um, if you go to Strasbourg and you say, it, um, we were convicted by a jury and they didn't give reasons, the Strasbourg court will say, yes, they did. We know what their reasons are because the judge directed them on the facts and the law. And therefore, uh, we know precisely why this person was convicted and our court of appeal will look at the summing up and say well there's there those are the facts and there's the reason um 
Can I, add, can I come back on that? It, it is an interesting point. There are quite many of the, the cases that, that make that point are Scottish cases. But, you know, in Scotland at the moment, and it's going, it sounds as though it's going to change, you can be convicted by a simple majority of eight votes to seven. And it's against that background, you hear me say, I'd like somebody to give me the reason. David, what would you like to say about Lord Bonhamy's four arguments? Well, I, 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 I think the thing that I would ask is, how do you address the, um, the, 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 the fact that by involving judges to the extent that the inquisitorial system does involve judges, that you undermine the independence of the judiciary, which is a very, very important value that we have. And also, how do we maintain public confidence in the judiciary as a result of that? Well, the, the, the feature that I think helps to maintain the reputation of the judges is that they don't have to make the decisions in 50% or maybe more of the, 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 a greater percentage of the cases that we have in the country because these decisions are made by, by juries. Um, I, I uh, believe that, um, I, that we're both probably right in some respect here, and that the real answer to the question, and maybe this kills the debate, but <laughs> the, the, the real answer to the question is that there are, is much to be said on both sides, and it's finding the parts of both systems that work best, that's necessary. And the international system of criminal justice is a sort of experiment in amalgamating the two. It started off as utterly common law dominant. It's now much more uh, of a balance where uh, so many rules are, have been incorporated, the hearsay rules gone, into their um, written, a lot of written materials presented, but there's, there's still real-time cross-examination of the crucial witnesses. There's room, I think, for an amalgam of the two. <clears throat> Why doesn't Caroline see if she has questions to ask of these two formidable uh, speakers and opponents? And meanwhile, I have to announce that I'm not doing very well with the online question, so if I could have a little assistance with that. Can you all hear me? Don't all say yes at once. Can you all uh, hear me? You may be slightly in the shadow, Caroline, so... Right, there I we think are. That's, that's better. Can better. you hear me? <laughs> right. Um, Lord Bonamy, I'd like to start by asking you um, why you've got it in for the judges. Because it seems to me that what you're saying is that the roles in the court are fulfilled by prosecuting counsel and defending counsel, and the judge is almost just a spectator. Well, he shouldn't be. This, this, what, what is disturbing about this case is that the judge is an experienced judge, and my instant reaction is that shouldn't have happened. No, I agree Therefore, with you. Therefore, I'm, I'm with you on that, but it does happen. It's happening because you get the opportunity to get your question in before you can be stopped. And more damage can sometimes be done by trying to undo that. And you don't think the judge would have a role in stopping the question? Yes. When he can see where it's going, he or she can see where it's going, and saying, wait, we're going to deal with this I by think the sidebar or whatever one likes to call again, it. Again, you know, I'm, I'm having to agree with you, but, but um, I... <laughs> That's what you're meant to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I think that, that um, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of judges, and remember, uh, maybe not so much the high court judges, but those in, in our sheriff court, would be influenced here by the fact that the appeal court didn't seem to make much of this. I, I, I was very surprised at that, that, that very little was made of the way in which that cross-examination had been allowed to continue. So judges are in, a, in jury trials are very conscious of not doing anything that might result in a miscarriage of justice being declared at a later stage. But they do have a role in managing the evidence, in managing the jury, making sure the right questions get put. No? 
managing the jury in what sense? Well, helping the jury to understand the evidence. Yeah, we're, we're very slow in Scotland. To, to, <laughs> bear in mind that we don't sum up to juries. We simply give directions in law. And the average direction, even after a four-day assault or rape trial, might take 20, 25 minutes. It um, depends. Or it might be an hour. But it's not going to be more than an hour if it's being given by a, a decent judge. In Scotland, judge, a would, a judge, judge. would a judge in Scotland direct a jury, for example, on corroboration? Yes. Right. So the essentials will be there. Yes. And of course, we're trying to abolish corroboration for well, some know. reason, as I you know. know. <laughs> know. All right. Can I now turn, please, to Mr. Perry, <clears throat> David? Um, ultimate end is justice, yes? Yes. Because it seems to me that more <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, I was just thinking that that's a very, very big concept. It is. It? <laughs> Doing justice between the prosecution and the defence yes. is what it's about. Yes. In the interest of convicting the guilty and acquitting the innocent. Yes. Do we get that right? Yes. All the time? Um, we get it right on the... Uh, <clears throat> n not all the time. I mean, no system is perfect. No one would suggest another system is perfect. But uh, that's why we have uh, appeal courts... Uh, but um, we, 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 if we didn't get it right, we wouldn't um, we, we wouldn't have the system that we have um, with its durability, because people would be saying, "Well, what what's going wrong here?" And the great thing about our system, of course, it's not perfect. Of course, we've had the most egregious <clears throat> miscarriages of justice but that they have been recognized and, um, uh, and they are recognized for what they are. I mean, they are appalling miscarriages of justice, but I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the system. It was more to do with uh, particular individuals in pati at a particular time within the system. But if your thesis is right, those miscarriages of justice shouldn't be happening at all. Well, um, in, in any uh, system which is performed by fallible human beings, we will have uh, failures at times. But we have protections within the system, uh, very generous and liberal rights of appeal. And we have judges who preside uh, as judges to see that the parties are um, doing it properly and to ensure um, so far as they're able to, that there is the right burden. Well, I'm going to take a slightly unusual step, Mr. Moderator. We've got Professor Susan Edwards in the audience, yep. Buckingham University, who's a specialist in criminal law. <laughs> and as I was sitting in front of her, I noticed that she was making very careful notes. Susan, do you want to ask a question? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Meredith, Professor. Ah. And what we know, of course, Bill Desmond says so eloquently uh, that, the, that the jury is the last to show the truth of this. <clears throat> but I want to just bring the ground again to the race reform proposals in Scotland, which has again um, been discussed last month. And it's absolutely, if you put it, the case that the judges, almost all of them, have resisted the proposal uh, that's been put by not conservatives, but by perhaps radical feminists, as well as those on the uh, left, uh, have argued for the need to have judges because there is no confidence any longer in the jury system over rape cases. And to put it in a statistical context, if we look at the figures, we know that in rape convictions are higher in Scotland, sorry, rape acquittals are higher in Scotland, not proven verdicts for rape, I'm talking about rape, are higher. Uh, and this has led to this perhaps astonishing uh, suggestion. Thank you, Susan. Lord Bonamy, what do you think of that? Um, I, I, well, the, the, the I'm not, I didn't think the judges were opposed to it. My reference was to the solicitors who appear in the sheriff court to a, a man and woman are going to refuse to participate. So I understand. 
I, I, but also a retired judge, one of the retired judges has said that the proposal will not survive a challenge to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, largely because the Lord President will be given the power to select which judges uh, do rape trials. Now, I know that that practice has existed here for a long time where you get a ticket to do a rape trial. But that was perceived by some in Scotland as being an interference in judicial independence. Uh, if you're going to take a senior judge and sort of by the back door demote him through the activity of the Lord President. But on the question of a, a judge a, or judge only trials, um, I chaired a commission uh, which was appointed to identify safeguards we would need to introduce into the system if we abolish corroboration. And that led to the corroboration of abolition being booted into touch because we recommended that you really had to carry out research into the activities of the jury. And that research was conducted by a combination of uh, Mori, Ipsos Mori and Glasgow University. And it was following that that the Scottish government had a consultation and then decided that they would legislate for, um, well, for removing the not proven verdict was the first target. But then they've, they've, they're now proposed, there's a bill now to introduce jury on the trial. But that actually came more directly from Lady Dorian's own uh, committee, which uh, looked at uh, the issue and uh, expressed concern, obviously, about the rate of conviction. But then Parliament uh, seized it rather than, her, it was their, theirs rather than her initiative in the end, although she opened the door for them. Caroline, <clears throat> are we ready to move on to yeah, thank audience you. questions? Thank you very much. And the first one, which is, reflects a question I wanted to ask of David Perry in a slightly different form, is online. And then I'll turn to those in the room. And so an anonymous attendee, but never mind that, asks David this question. The panelists have focused, I think quite rightly, on the criminal justice system. I wonder whether they think, both of you really then, the adversarial system is fit for purpose in the family justice system. And you might want to broaden the question to ask whether it's fit for purpose in the civil law system as well. Well, <clears throat> I think the, the, the first thing is I, I'd, I'd have to be very, very diffident about answering anything about uh, the, the family jurisdiction because I, I simply don't have the expertise to express an opinion. I think that uh, in, in ordinary civil proceedings uh, without a jury, I think the adversarial system um, does work extremely well. And I think, again, it has shown the ability of the common law to, to adapt, because I think that's the, that's the brilliance of our system, which is the fact that uh, you can reform within the system um, without doing violence to the overall general structure. And, and if you're going to do anything, that's what, you, what, that's what we should be, be thinking about. And I think the, the, the use of greater written pleadings um, uh, judges reading in um, and case management hearings, all of those things uh, mean that uh, cases are, are, are tried economically and uh, efficiently. But still on the basis of party against party choice of the case to argue. Lord Bonamy. Well, well I, I think there's far more scope for a, the removal of the adversarial elements in, in family proceedings than there is in crime. Um, but the quotation I read early in, in my submission was from a civil case, the one about being no better than a boxing, than a referee at a boxing contest, uh, counting the points um, and seeing that the rules are kept. Now, um, I, I think family, family arena is, is one where there's been huge development, certainly in Scotland, and it, it's uh, the, the procedural, uh, there are very few um, evidential hearings. They're, they're reduced to a minimum because in, agreement among the parties is encouraged and judicial in intervention 
to reach that stage is encouraged. And that's one area, I think, it's probably the prime area for that sort of activity. I think the question of suitability as a system for family law is something that we might ask if we have time, Caroline Wilborn, because she had a huge experience in that area, or you can ask her outside at the drinks process <laughs> when you can catch her at a table where she'll be yours to interrogate. Questions from the room, please. Yes, sir. You better have a microphone. I think we'll, it'll make it easier for us and for the recording, because this is online and it's recorded. Thank you. I think I've answered that three main issues in the, between you uh, tonight. One is the ability of judges to carry out their own investigations. Uh, the second is how a defendant should be able to test uh, the evidence against him or her. And third is whether juries or judges uh, should ultimately decide the verdict. Now, is it, is it more appropriating to consider those in isolation? Inquisitorial. Well, the uh, suggestion was maybe that we are able to merge. That comes from Lord Bonamy with experience of various systems and also being counsel to a very famous or sad but famous inquiry, the Dun Blaine inquiry. So let's ask David Perry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think they are um, uh, interrelated because how, how are you going to, how is a defendant going to test evidence if he doesn't have his skillful um, uh, uh, adversary, um, the, 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 his skillful um, uh, lawyer, um, to put forward his case as his advocate. And I, I also think that um, drawing judges into investigating and making decisions uh, does come at a cost. I mean, I think that's why in the common law system we have very, very discursive judgments, and it's because judges are free to give rein to their ideas. And if you go to if if you go to the, the continental systems, the judges of the, the judgments are very concise and compact, a paragraph or more, because you, you don't have that discursiveness, the development of the law that comes through um, the adversarial system. And I do think that one of the glories of our system is the fact that the expertise of a cadre of lawyers has been one of the greatest motivating drivers for the development of the law. Because if you didn't have lawyers arguing about these things all the time, um, we wouldn't have the illuminating um, discussions that you, you get in court. So I think they are all interrelated. But I do think that if you look at what goes on now with um, um, recorded evidence in criminal proceedings with vulnerable witnesses, that they're not allowed to be cross-examined in, in court. There, there's, there, there, there's much that can be done within the criminal procedure rules to make sure that we maintain our system but have proper testing. Well, Bonnery, I'd like you to answer the same question since you rather raised the merger point. Is it really all or nothing? But perhaps you could also deal with your experience, not of the high-flown, high intellectuals who appear at the courts to be dwarfed by David Perry, but by the Serbs and the Croats and the Kosovo Albanians, who you may have, not sure about Kosovo Albanians, who you may have seen acting in the international courts where you've worked. Do you pine for an English or British advocate to come, or do you find value in the others? Well, I... Um love a sporting contest and I have to say that as a practicing advocate I enjoyed nothing better than cross-examining an accused person as the only witness in the defense case followed immediately by being called upon to make my submissions to the jury and that combination together was the area where I secured most success. Um, so I can see the value in cross-examination, I don't dispute it, in, and followed by the, the legal reasoning that uh, the Continentals so 
uh, respect. But I'm sitting at the moment uh, in The Hague uh, with an American, uh, a Moroccan, and a Portuguese. And the Moroccan and the Portuguese, uh, the, the issue for us was the fitness of the accused to continue to be on trial. And the Moroccan and the Portuguese take the view that he is, and the American and the Scot take the view that he's not. Um, and the case that's been presented that he is, and uh, the trial should just carry on as if it were a normal adversarial trial, even though he's on the verge of, of um, being unable to participate to any extent at all, is based on the idea that everything has to be legally rationalized. And when you get to the end of the presentation of all the evidence and you've done your best with him, you can then decide the significance of his mental condition on the fairness of the trial. Now, I find that very difficult to accept. So there's a good example of where I would part company with the argument I'm trying to advance today. I think the adversarial process um, deals better with certain things. There's no doubt about that, that one. And the advocates, the Serbian advocates, <coughs> the Croatian advocates, do they well, match what you find in Strasbourg and Luxembourg? I, they, they, well, the Serbian, the, the advocates we've had to deal with from the, the Balkans uh, and, and, uh, and, and many uh, French advocates uh, from in the Rwandan cases all have adapted remarkably well to the adversarial system. They know all the tricks of the trade in no time. Um, and, 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 and it's just the same game of playing tig with the rocks that, that you would get anywhere else. Um, so um, people adapt. But I'm, I go back always to the, the point, the basic point, that is there a good reason for the decision that's made? And the, the, um, the civil law system makes great play of the rationalization and legal reasoning that's behind their decisions. I'd like to take <coughs> at least three more questions. I've been given five <coughs> minutes, which means that Sir Ivan Lawrence, who is well acquainted with the method of asking questions, 30 seconds, Sir Ivan. Can I just say that after 61 years of practice at the criminal bar, I have no doubt whatsoever that the adversarial system is better than its alternative, and that it is also the most effective way we have yet devised of finding the truth. Because so your I, question to our two my question <laughs> Peters. Is, well, I just thought I ought to let you know where <laughs> I was coming from. My question is... 20 seconds, if you, what you What you need when you cross-examine to establish the truth or whatever is the facts, the data, the information. Now, um, how in the continental system where the judge makes the inquiries, not just conducts the questioning, but makes the inquiries, can you guarantee that he has all the necessary data? In our defense system, we have solicitors who look for the evidence. But in the continental system, if the judge is just making, asking the questions, where is he getting well, a lot of the evidence the answer from? To that? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do know a man who does. Uh, and, and I have a brilliant idea I hope to convey to Jeffrey after, after tonight. Uh, there, there are, uh, one particular judge is present in the International Criminal Court of Germany who's adapted remarkably to the, the adversarial system and has become uh, a, a fan but um, sees the benefits in, in uh, proceeding the way he has used as far as he can. And it would be great to involve someone in a similar debate, Jeffrey, on a topic who comes from yes, absolutely. a country, uh, a jurisdiction where that's practiced. Thank you. A quick question online. Can the adversarial system 
be considered a truth-finding exercise that is effective with the rise in plea deals? Um, y y yes, uh, uh, is the short answer to that. Um, but why is it yes? But, well, uh, well, well. F first of all, um, I, I, I think that pe people plead. Uh, they, they know the facts, and and if you plead and you put forward a basis of plea, it's on the basis that those facts are uh, what you accept. And um, I think that um, we, the the system is. Uh, the, 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 the most efficient at uncovering uh, the truth um, because it, it is so rare that we ever read about a case that is decided by a jury where there is um, a, a, a uproar or outrage at the uh, verdict or outcome and um, that there is not uh, a general swell of public opinion that when people plead guilty or when judges sentence them, the, 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 the system is misfiring in some way. And of course, we, we, we have the ability uh, now in sentencing cases for cases to be appealed to the Court of Appeal uh, if the prosecution are dissatisfied with the sentence. So there are all these controls within the system that ensure that it is accurate in the way that it adjudicates. And that's the most we could expect of any system. As David Perry said, that was a yes. <laughs> and one last short question from the room. Yes, sir. Good evening. I think it was Lord Bonamy who said um, that many members of the bar might feel very much at home on stage performing for an audience. My question for either speaker or both speakers is, is this thespian side to the courtrooms in an adversarial system uh, a distraction, a symptom, a worrying symptom, or on the contrary, would either of you be sad to see it go in a different system? Well, it, it, it's um, a source of great enjoyment to me and, and, and many, it has been on, on many occasions. Um, I think if um, the accused is, is a, fits the normal um, profile, it's unlikely to make much difference. I think in particular cases, it can make a definite difference. Before Master <clears throat> Treasurer closes the event, this part of it, before we go out to the reception, can I close with uncertainty built on an observation made by a bencher of this inn to whom I already referred, the late judge Sir Richard May, who prosecuted the Milosevic case to the end of the prosecution and then died very quickly and shortly afterwards to be replaced by Lord Bonamy. In my team, at that, in, there was an earlier case that I'd done in front of him. And in that case, one of my junior counsel was a French advocate who absolutely refused to have anything to do with cross-examination and obviously didn't think much of the English system and indeed was a French investigative judge. I felt it my duty to persuade him against his inclination to do a little cross-examining. And he did. And to his surprise, he enjoyed it. But I spoke to Richard May about it afterwards. And he said, oh, yes, he said, the last legal blood sport. <laughs> well, thank you very much to our audience to consider which is this if you were guilty of a crime and you had the choice of being cross-examined by any of the people on this panel <laughs> or being dealt with by them on an inquisitorial basis which would you choose <laughs> i think probably the answer is either way you'd lose don't you <laughs> thank you so much to our very illustrious panel for um, a very insightful eloquent and persuasive arguments which show that whether or not they believed a word that they were saying, <laughs> they have been, been wonderful advocates in either form of system. And last but not least, a big thank you to Caroline, who has stepped in in the best traditions of the bar at the very last minute. Half an hour <laughs> yes, <laughs> brief at court. <laughs> um, a doc brief at that end. No, no, no money involved. There will be a drink, so that's fine.
So thank you very much indeed to all of you for a wonderful evening.